Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Hello, my name is Ted Holsey. I'm Vice President of Marketing at eFolder and your host for today's event. Um, welcome to the eFolder Partner Chats. This webinar brings together leading eFolder partners for business-oriented discussions. The topic for today's event is the road to recurring revenue, stepping up to manage services. Today we are joined by Linda Lynch, President of KI Technology Group. In just a moment, I will further introduce Linda. Before we go through the agenda, let's cover a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded. The recorded version of the webinar will be made available on eFolder's YouTube channel. We will also make copies of the slides available to those who attended the event. With over 150 people registered for today's session, we have put all participants in listen-only mode. You can enjoy the audio portion of today's event by either streaming it to your computer or by dialing in over the phone. Questions are strongly encouraged throughout. We have planned a special Q&A section at the end of today's discussion, but you may submit as we go along and we will try to address your questions on the fly. Linda is going to share her story of transforming KI Technology Group to a, to a managed services model and a recurring revenue business model. She will share her firsthand experiences and give you several best practices that she has learned along the way. Now let me introduce Linda. Linda Lynch is president of KI Technology Group. A computer programmer by training, Linda has held programming positions at Consumers Energy and Burroughs Corporation before coming to KI Technology Group in 1986. At KI Technology Group, Linda has handled most aspects of supporting and training clients, acquired an ownership interest in the company in 1990, and has been serving as president since 1992. She has been instrumental in managing the company's transition from a software company to a full-service technology company, providing outsourced IT services to businesses in the greater Lansing, Michigan area. Linda, thanks for joining us today, and welcome. Thanks, Ted. I'm happy to be here. Okay, well, let's, um, let's kind of get right into it. Um, I guess why don't you just start out by um, explaining the why behind transforming KI Technology Group to a managed services model. Why did you pursue that? What did you what did you what were the what was the original catalyst to do that? Well originally I probably didn't really have an understanding of why it was the best idea for my company. I think I've developed that over time. But we've been working at delivering managed services since about 2006, was which was kind of the early stages of when there started being tools available to deliver managed services with. So at the time, it was kind of, you know, this is what people are talking about. There's people that I respect that, that run companies similar to mine. This is what they're talking about. So this is probably what we ought to do, too. Over time, you start to realize that it's much easier to build a company on a solid base of recurring revenue than it is on projects or break-fix revenue. Um, you know, if you sell, if you start off from nothing and you sell a thousand dollars a month in new recurring revenue, by the end of the year, you're billing twelve thousand dollars a month, and you've built seventy-eight thousand dollars. And even better than that, you start the next year with $144,000 that you know you're going to get in revenue. So that's really the thing that uh, we focus on now is increasing our, our monthly recurring revenue each and every month. Now you mentioned that you know in the beginning you were kind of inspired by, by some other people. I mean, were there peers or, or anybody else in the industry that really helped kind of inspire you to get started? They were peers. Yeah, I was a member of the ASCII group, was the first organization I joined, and I went to some of the ASCII events that are held regionally, and I was um, listening to presentations from Kaseya, and uh, there was a company back then called High Blue. I think they pretty much disappeared. You know, that were um, obviously they wanted me to buy their tools, but you know we were starting to look at that, and then in talking to the people that I met through the ASCII group, a number of them that I thought had very successful companies were looking at the same thing. And you know, one thing you don't want to do in this industry is get left behind. Right, and kind of why don't we kind of talk about uh, getting started. So you said you, were, you really started this <clears throat> this transformation in around 2006. Um, you and I, you know, talked a couple days ago on the phone. But just 
the most important thing you kind of shared with me is just getting started. Can you talk a little bit more about your views around that? I, I sure can. I, mean, I think a lot of times, um, a lot of us tend to be perfectionists, and we want to feel like we have everything perfect, and we know exactly how we're going to deliver the service, and exactly how to sell it, and we have everything just perfect before we go out and start talking to clients or prospects about what we want to do. And really, what you have to do is you have to just get started. Um, you know, you're not going to have it perfect right out of the box. And certainly the way we presented what we do back then and the way we present it now are completely and totally different. The other thing that, you know, may be an issue is that you don't believe initially that your clients are actually going to buy this. So you have to work on changing your beliefs and and really truly believing that the product you're offering is the best thing for your clients. Um, the, the slide that you have up there now, I mentioned that, you know, what we do now was, what we did back then is much different from what we do now. And the slide that you have up there now is what we did when we ran our first campaign to our existing clients to let them know that we had a new way of delivering service. This is what we presented to them. And as you can see, it's a pretty detailed list of here's all the technical stuff we're going to do for you depending on what level you choose. We're going to do this and on what interval are we going to do that. And, you know, believe it or not, we actually got some sales from that, but it's not at all what we do now. And in fact, the plan doesn't even look quite like this anymore because you can always tweak your plan as you go along. What we do now, if you want to go to that next slide, um, is we talk much more about the value of what we deliver. So this is the package of information that we've put together for clients that we think are good prospects for our managed services. It's much more just educating them about technology. Um, it's a lot of client testimonials, which of course we didn't really have back in 2006. It's offering guarantees around our services um, and also using some of the articles that have been written about us and articles that I've written to elevate the status of our company and, and get people to, to believe that we're an expert and that we can be trusted. Fantastic. So I guess what if we kind of kind of back up to when you got started? I, I love the insight that you know uh, you know perfection is the enemy of the good. I mean, if you're too obsessed with getting it exactly right, you just never get started. So you really want to overcome that. But what were some of the what were some of the anxieties you had um, in introducing new managed service uh, offerings with a completely different business model? What were some of those anxieties you had? What, what were some of the objections you anticipated? Um, well, I think the anxiety is, you know, is this tool that I've purchased, whatever tool it is, is it really going to enable my staff to do everything that we're saying we can do on this piece of paper? Or are there going to be places, you know, we're going to get into it, and we're going to find out we can't really deliver what we're promising. So that's always an anxiety. Um, and I remember like one of the first sales calls I went on, because we sent out a letter to you know, maybe 40 clients that we were working with. And I went out to talk to one of them about whether or not they wanted to sign up. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, knowing what they were spending with us, which wasn't really very much, it was a pretty small client, I'm thinking they're never going to go for this. There's no way they're going to sign up for this contract. And I went out and I, you know, I talked to them and I actually said in the meeting, you know, I know if I were you, I'm not sure I'd sign up for this. And they said, well, I think it's a great idea. Where's the contract? And they signed up for our mid-level plan, and they're still a client today, you know, 12 years or six years later. So you can't assume that you know what clients will or won't think it's a good idea. Um, it's sort of a miracle we sold that one. Um, now that we approach it from value rather than, you know, here's what they're spending now and here's what we want to charge them, you know, you're delivering a lot more for what you're going to charge them under managed services, and you need to understand that there's a value to that and talk about the value and not talk about the technical 
details of what you're going to provide. And what are you finding are, are the main kind of value points that, uh, that really resonate with uh, your clientele? I think the value points are just that we're going to take care of everything for the client. Most of the clients that we sign today sign up for our all-inclusive plan. And they like the idea that they know no matter what happens, we're going to take care of it for them. About half of our clients are nonprofits. And when I say nonprofits, people think of charity. And in fact, we only have, I think, one that is really a charitable nonprofit. Most of them are associations or member organizations of some type, and they really understand budgeting. So they have a certain amount of money that they're going to have to work with throughout the year. They also have a board of directors that's going to approve that budget, and it's going to look at their financial reports compared to budget. Not a lot of small business owners do that, although we should all do that. Um, so when you go to a nonprofit and you say, you know, for $1,000 a month, $1,500 a month, whatever it is, we'll take care of all of your technology and you're not taking a risk anymore for an unexpected expense, that's very attractive to them. So, you know, the other thing that, that makes it attractive is, is a business owner or association executive that just doesn't want to deal with technology, they don't want their staff de dealing with technology, they want to be focused on what their organization does and not deal with the day-to-day -day issues that come up with technology. Okay, great. And, and maybe it would be helpful for um, our listeners today. I want to remind everybody, um, please ask questions as we go along. I'm monitoring the Q&A log here, so any questions you ask in real time, I'll be able to ask Linda. Um, but Linda, maybe if you could, can you talk a little bit about KI Technology Group, um, give kind of an overview of the size of the company and uh, where, you, where you're focused, who you serve, and that sort of thing, just to give some context to our listeners. Sure. Um, today we are about, we're 13 employees. Um, we still do, you mentioned software when you were introducing me. We started as a software company um, in the early 80s and we've transitioned. We started doing network support, desktop and server support in 2000, um, kind of in response to the Y2K issues that were going on then. And then, as I mentioned, in 2006, we started working on managed services. Um, we didn't, I wouldn't say we had a fast start. It was very, very slow start. Um, it wasn't really until maybe four years ago when I hired a salesperson to handle sales that we started growing that part of our business, you know, not not incredibly rapidly, but consistently, let's say. Um, so today we've built up our managed services, or our, our monthly recurring revenue is now in about $55,000 range. Um, and we have a goal this year of getting to 82, not quite, about 82,000. So we're really focused on recurring revenue these days. Okay, so you have a really, I mean, so you've made great progress and you have a, a strong growth plan to get to even higher uh, monthly recurring sales levels. What, how, you know, if you kind of wind back the clock in, in 2006, I mean, would you say you had very little or none, no recurring revenue, and then today, like, what percentage of your overall revenues are recurring? Um, yeah, in 2006, very little was recurring revenue. Um, now our... Our recurring revenue is close to half of our monthly revenue. Okay. Okay, great. Great. So a uh, question comes in from Chuck. Um, when you added your first salesperson, aside from you, what were, what were the first one or two things that they did, that you did, to help get them out of the gate? Uh, well, the first thing we did, I guess, was probably during the interview process, um, going e explaining to him what we did and how we did it. Um, somehow I managed to do it in a way that got him excited about coming to work for us. 
Um, and his job prior to coming here was actually selling paint, which is obviously not at all related to technology, <laughs> which is probably a good thing um, because you know he can't go out and talk in great technical detail about things because that's not his background. That's not what his skill set is. However, selling services is a lot different than selling paint. So it took a long time to get him up to speed, but you know, being able to communicate what you do as a company and what your goals are and why you believe that the, the, uh, your service offerings are the best service offerings for your clients is key to getting a salesperson fired up about selling for you. I probably did a better job of selling him than I did any of our prospects. Well, that's uh, definitely you know, the place to start when you're trying to recruit that first really critical salesperson. Um, Linda, you're involved with a lot of community organizations, CompTIA, ASCII. I know you're uh, involved with Robin Robbins. What are, what are some of the mistakes you see other business owners making when they're hiring their first salesperson? I've, I've heard a ton of stories of woe, frankly, on the sales front. What are, what are some of the mistakes you've, you've seen made by, by business owners? Um, I guess they run, run the gamut. Um, yeah, I think sometimes people hire salespeople thinking that they're going to be immediately productive. And that may not be, a, I, I don't think that's a rational expectation unless they've sold something very, very similar. You know, if they're coming from one of your competitors and they've been successful, then obviously they ought to be able to deliver for you quickly. But if they don't have experience in technology or they don't have experience selling services, then it's going to take them a while to get up to speed. And depending on you know what you have in your pipeline at the time. And at the time that we hired him, we didn't do a lot of marketing, so it wasn't like I was handing him a list of prospects and saying, here, go work these. It really was, that was the point when we really started focusing on doing our marketing and bringing in new clients. So it was you know quite a while before we saw any results from hiring him. And, and when did you... When did you start really feeling like proud and excited about your marketing results? And can you talk a little bit about your decision to uh, work with Robin Robbins? Well, I've worked. I've, I've been a member of Robin's program for a long time, and a member of her producers club for just over four years now. Um, it was more a commitment to actually using the material and seeing the results from it rather than just you know reading her newsletter every month and not really doing anything. The thing that really has made the difference for me is when I started setting goals. And if you go on to the next slide, um, we, I'm now a fanatic about goals. So we set. Um, an annual revenue goal, a total revenue goal every year, and then also a total monthly recurring revenue goal. And then within that, in fact, the way we arrive at that total monthly recurring revenue goal is we think about the major categories of monthly recurring revenue that we have and how many contracts we think we can add per month or per, per quarter and what the average value of those will be. Um, so we sat down at the beginning of the year and said, okay, um, we want to go for a little bit bigger clients this year, so let's look at bringing in managed services contracts that average about $1,500 a month, and we'd like one of those every month. And starting from where we are, where should we be at the end of the year if we're able to do that? We did the same thing for our backup contracts. Um, the cloud services that's listed here is kind of a shot in the dark because that's new for us. So, you know, it's, it's a, a goal and, and we're struggling in that area, but it's still nice to have goals. And then those KICC contracts is a residential monitoring program that we have in place. So that's why there's you know, lower dollars there. Now, if you add those up, you'll figure out that that doesn't add to the number I've got. And that's because we have a lot of other different kinds of monthly recurring revenue for things like spam filtering, um, web hosting that aren't really focuses for us. They're just kind of things that we do in addition. Um, 
for a little extra revenue that don't really cost us a lot to deliver, and I don't really set goals for those. So I, I have goals for the year. I, so that leads me to goals for every quarter, and I could give you goals for every month if, if I needed to. We don't look at it that finely. And I put together this spreadsheet, and this is posted three different places around our office so that everyone knows what our goals are and what our progress is towards those goals. I update that at least at the end of every month. I try to do it more often, but it kind of depends on what else is going on. So at any point in time, people know about where we are and how much farther we need to go to reach our quarter goals and to reach our annual goals. And so t talk a little bit more about that. I mean, do, you know, when you, who else helps you formulate the goals? Is there anyone else on the team who kind of helps you formulate the goals? Or, you know, I mean, and I guess the other part of it is, you know, how, how serious do people take it every, every month, you know, you know, whether you're 5% off plan or 10% off plan or 10% above plan? What's kind of people's reactions to that? Um, well, we, we try not to get too stressed out when we're below plan because things don't always happen. Um, on the schedule that you set out. So we're in a little bit of a, you, we had a great first quarter. We surpassed our total revenue goal. We were a little short on MRR. For some reason, sold a ton of product, which I don't even set a goal for, um, that we talk about anyway. There is one, but we don't really talk about it. We don't stress that. Um, second quarter has been a little quiet, but we've got a, a bunch of, of Product, uh, prospects in the pipeline and a lot that look really, really good. So we just keep focusing on that. Who do we have that we're talking to that we think is going to sign a contract? And if it happens a little bit late, it happens a little bit late. You know, so we haven't you know, onboarded anybody in a couple months, and you know, then we'll have a month where we have three or four, and it's kind of too much to handle all at once. But we'll figure out how to get through it. Um, I forget the rest of your question now. I'm sorry. No, no. Well, that's that. No, that that's that's great. So I mean, that just just trying to you know give us some context in, in terms of how uh, the you know your organization internally reacts to the kind of the goal setting process. W what do you do? What 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 kind of things do you do once you once you see you trending? You know, if there is a, a metric where you're falling behind, I mean, what's your what's your reaction to that, and how do you take corrective action? Well, if I thought the issue was that we didn't have enough prospects, then I would look at doing additional marketing or maybe doing some new things um, or figuring out you know, how we could sell more to the clients we already have. One campaign that I ran uh, late last year, and I don't think I told you about this before, but um, in December, one of the things that I decided to do was just send out a quick email to all of our clients who had servers but did not have a BDR. Um, I sent it to 17 or 18, and I got eight appointments out of that and sold three BDRs. And it didn't cost me anything to run that campaign. So I would look at things like that. Are there you know, maybe some people I can approach in a, an inexpensive way to get some additional revenue out of those? Um, not having prospects hasn't really been a problem for us this year. We have gotten more new leads this year. We've gotten 47 new opportunities this year so far as opposed to 58 all of last year. So okay. not having prospects isn't a problem for us. We're seeing some longer sales cycles on some of them. Um, you know, we've got one client we're working with now, and, and that's one thing about nonprofits is that sometimes it takes them longer to make a decision because they have a board and there's just more people involved in the decision making or at least the um, putting their stamp of okay on it. So it can be a much longer process. We've been working with them since the end of February or first part of March and hope to have the contract details worked out and the contract signed next week. So that's three months. Okay, I, I want to I drill into kind of what you're doing on the marketing front, what are some of the actual tactical things. But before we go to that, uh, kind of a follow-on question to getting that first sales rep productive. Jason wants to know how long 
is quote, quote unquote quite a while for a sales rep to start producing? Was it weeks? Was it months? And is, is there a rough rule of thumb in terms of what, what you see has worked? Um, well, I've only ever hired one salesperson, so I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that question. But I would say it took six months to a year okay. to, to really get him ramped up and, and feel like he was productive. So it's not something, you know, if, if you're struggling to make ends meet and you think you're going to hire a salesperson and that's going to solve all your problems, it's probably not going to solve all your problems. So it's just going to add to your expenses without getting some revenue coming in first. And if you haven't really figured out, you know, how you're going to get your get prospects, um, the salesperson isn't necessarily going to do that, depending on if they're more of a hunter or a farmer. You know, if they're a hunter, then maybe they'll get out there and, and find some prospects if they have the right kind of connections. But if they're really more of a farmer, then that's not going to happen. Well, yeah, and I think that, you know, an observation that I would make is that, that that's often the the big challenge that I see a lot of organizations go through is that the, you know, in the in the early days, the business principal is the 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 one and only salesperson, right? And they're out there, you know, beating the bushes and getting the leads and and engaging with clients and getting all the business. And then they reach a certain point where they're like, I need a salesperson, and they bring a salesperson on, but they have, in most cases, they have no marketing. So not only are you dealing with a situation where you've got somebody who's um, you know who needs to who needs to ramp and you know needs to ramp up and get trained and get familiar with all the services and products. You've got a situation where they've got absolutely no pipeline. They've got no leads coming in the door and no qualified prospects to go after. And I think that's what a, a, a you know many many you know I'm, I talk with a lot of partners who are in HTG and that's they they th they either come to the conclusion that they're bad at hiring salespeople or they're bad at managing salespeople because every single one of these guys just gets fired because they're not successful. But I always beg the question of, you know, what are you doing on the marketing front? Because you can't really ex expect a salesperson to be productive and successful right. if they don't have lead leads coming in the door. Right, and a salesperson is not necessarily a marketing person. Absolutely, and you're not. They're not going to wear both. In most cases, they're not going to wear both hats unless they're kind of a superstar. Right. So, could you could you talk a little bit about what you're doing on a tactical basis? Just what are some of the things that you do to generate interest and generate a consistent supply of new prospects coming in for your salesperson? Okay, the single best source for new prospects has been our web page. So we've spent time working on our website, um, trying to make it speak to a client or a prospect and not to another technical person. So on our website, you won't see a long list of here's all the technical things we do. We talk about the benefits to our clients. We also spent some time working on what the keywords should be to try and come up higher in um, the natural searches. And we do some Google AdWords, not a lot. I, and, and I can't really say that I get anything specifically from that. It's a little bit hard to measure because of the way Google makes you do things. But we get most, we've got nine calls already this year from people who have said, we found you on the internet. The next two biggest sources, I just happen to have a sheet that has this on it, um, are referrals and networking activities or networking groups that we belong to or have belonged to. So definitely being out there in the community and making sure people know who you are is a key piece. Um, and also making sure that you are getting referrals from your clients. And a lot of times we don't want to sit down with our clients and say, well, you know, who do you know that might be a good prospect for us? But that's something that you can do when you sit down and have meetings with your clients. Um, be sure you thank them in some way for the referrals that they give you. Um, I know a lot of people who run referral contests or formal referral, you know, they publish in their newsletter that they're going to pay for referrals. We've never had great success with that, but we do get a lot of referrals. Um, 
after that, it's kind of a mishmash. We, one thing that we do that is probably pretty unique is we do some radio advertisements. And we mm -hmm. advertise on talk radio stations. And we get a lot of calls from people who hear our ad on the radio. So we've gotten five calls this year from people who've heard radio ads, which is yeah, a decent number. It's not the least expensive way of marketing, so it's not a place I would recommend people start. We also do, we do a newsletter every month that goes out now to almost 800 people. So those are clients, their prospects, their friends. And we send it to some people who are probably never going to be good prospects for us, but they're people that we know do a lot of networking in the community, so you never know when they're going to run into someone who might be a good prospect for us. And I'll add that some of those referrals that we get come from people who aren't even clients of ours. They're people that we know because we've met them at some event. Maybe they know someone we do work for, but they themselves are not always clients. We also do direct mail, so we've run uh, two campaigns this year um, so far, mm -hmm. which are generally a series of three letters and maybe some emails in between to try and get new prospects from that. Uh, our list that we run those kinds of campaigns to is much smaller even than our newsletter list. It uh, only has about 225 people on it, but we've gotten four prospects that way. We also d do some email campaigns. I've done some seminars. I've done a seminar on cloud computing this year. I had also done one the end of last year that generated a lot of interest. From the one that we just did about a month ago, we're going to do one cloud assessment for someone who's already a managed services client that came to the seminar. But we had someone that we had been marketing to that came that now we are going to talk to them, not about cloud, but about managed services. So just because your seminar is on cloud doesn't mean that you know that's the only thing you can sell from that. I think he came to the seminar kind of as a, I, these people have been marketing to me. I'm not entirely happy with who I'm using now. I'm going to check them out and see who they are. Well, great. And tell me about on the on the newsletter you send out. Is that a snail mail newsletter or an email newsletter? How does that work? We do it both ways. We we mail a copy to close to 800 people, and we have another 150 that are on an email list. Every newsletter goes out and says, "If you would rather receive this electronically, let us know, and we'll switch you over." Most people prefer it apparently on paper. Personally, I prefer a newsletter on paper because I will take it home um, and read it, you know, like on a Saturday morning over my morning coffee or juice, uh, sitting in an easy chair, and that's easier for me than to read it electronically. It gets lost in the thousands of emails I have if it, I get it electronically. Right, and I think it's a real important thing for people to remember that that traditional approaches um, really still have a lot of value and they can it's not about it's not an either or thing it's a both and these things complement right. each other and there's parts of your audience that are going to respond to different kinds of, of tactics right, um, right. you know the one thing one, go ahead I'm sorry. The other thing that's really important is that just because you marketed to someone once and they didn't respond doesn't mean that they're never going to respond so we've had a number of people respond to campaigns that we've run. Last year, my birthday was on Easter, and so I ran an Easter birthday campaign, had my picture taken at the mall with the Easter bunny, and used that in the letter. Um, the person, we only had one response from that, but we stole them, and we had been marketing to him for two years. Well, during those two years, he didn't have a need. But when the second letter of that campaign showed up on his desk, he had just learned that morning that the guy he'd been working with was going to work in an IT department for a specific company and wasn't going to be available anymore. So now he had a need. If I had just marketed to him at the outset and then forgot about him, he, he would have called anybody. So you right. have and to so, keep your yeah. name in front of people. Yeah, the consistency and persistence is, is key because people are not always going to be in the buying mode, but you're building your brand 
and that repetition is you'll end up hitting people when that need does crop up. Um, uh, you know, one, one of the things that's really impressive as you were kind of going through the range of tactics you follow is you've got metrics for everything. You, you know, I mean, you know, some of the brand advertising, you don't know, okay, well, how much of it is it working, how much of it is being wasted, but you've got a really good, you've really got really good metrics on what's working for you and where your prospects and leads are coming from. Yes, and, and we also know how many from each source are converting. It's on another sheet of paper, but you know, we track that as well. So at any given point in time, I can tell you how many open leads from each of those sources, how many um, we decided weren't really good opportunities for us, and how many of them we lost to a competitor, or how many just decided, you know, basically never decided and they're doing whatever they were doing before, and how many we want. And that's... We were working on that last year, was coming up with a tracking system. I would sort of resisted that because I couldn't figure out how to make it perfect. I still don't think it's perfect. It's back to that perfection thing. But, you know, you have to start with something. And then we say, you know, it would be nice if we knew some other piece of information and we add it in so that we're getting even more information from it. Absolutely, and I think the I mean I think the mess, message is really clear though here that that uh, there's no there's no silver bullet as you're you're if you're looking to transform your business to a recurring revenue model to drive growth you are going to have to find new clientele it's not going to be only about converting your base and to to get that growth you need a, it's a one-two punch. At least it's you need a sales you need sales resources that are dedicated and compensated to find recurring revenue opportunities and manage services contracts. But you have to really fill the pipeline with with leads and prospects of people who are you know suspects, and if they're qualified, they become prospects, and then paying clients once you're able to get them to sign on the dotted line. So um, it's pretty impressive the the range of marketing activities you're doing to drive those new client acquisitions. So why don't we um, go to kind of the third area that you've, that you've had to master to, to, okay. to complete this transformation and okay. talk a little before, bit about service delivery. Oh, okay, go before ahead. Before we talk about this, I have one more point that came up as you were commenting there at the end. Um, while we did that initial campaign and we converted some of our existing clients to managed services clients, but after that, it may be easier to find new clients to, to buy into managed services than to convert your existing clients. Because you've, you've trained your existing clients to work on a break-fix model. And if they're happy with that, they may be reluctant to switch to a managed services plan. Not to say they never will. We had a client that had been a client for some time that's getting our newsletter every month and we're all constantly talking in the newsletter about managed services and the plans we offer. And they called us out of the blue in December and said, we've decided we need to be on a managed services plan and we need to spend some money by the end of the year and we want to prepay for a three-year contract. And now they're so glad that they've done it. And I would have never in a million years thought that they were going to do that because they weren't spending that much money with us. Um, but they did. But in that, you know, once you get the, the what we'll call the low-hanging fruit in your existing client base, you're going to have to go out and look for new people. And maybe you'll even find some people who have a managed services contract with a competitor and they don't think the competitor is delivering what they promise. That's a perfect opportunity for you. What do you find when, when – um, um, it sounds like you've had some situations like that where people have come to you from competition. What are the, what are the main pain points they're fleeing from? Um, sometimes it's that they don't think that the provider is responding as quickly as they should. So that's a big one. Um, other times it's that they are paying a monthly fee, but they are getting billed for other things separately, and they don't understand then what they're paying for in the monthly fee. So whether it's that the provider isn't communicating well what they're doing for that monthly fee or whether they're really not delivering much for the monthly fee at all, I can't say um, because I don't have all the information. But 
know, if you're paying a hefty monthly monthly fee and then getting, you know, another bill every month and it feels like I'm paying a monthly fee, but every time I call I still get billed, that's probably not going to work too well. All right. So it's got to be, I mean, I think it raises a really important point in managed services that, it, you know, getting somebody on the contract is only half the battle. It's really over time making sure it's crystal clear to your clientele the value they're deriving, so things like periodic reporting. Um, I don't know if you do quarterly business reviews or periodic, um, you know, visits with them to kind of review reporting. And I mean, if you don't, if everything's, you know, I, I always, you know, I've worked in this business pretty long time, and I, I spent a couple years at SonicWall, and and one of the, the, the interesting things about the security aspect of a managed service contract is if everything's going extremely well. Many times the client's not aware of the value you're driving, so you really need to bring home the reporting to show the client in a very simple way all the threats you're stopping, for instance, or all the you know unwanted X Y Z that you're trying to keep out. Um, you know that that's a that's a key part of continuing that recurring revenue is demonstrating the value over time. Right. So then uh, what happens as you grow, and we've grown quite a bit over the last year or year and a half. So we added um, two, p three positions since January of 2011, um, and a lot of clients as well. Um, but you have to watch your service delivery. And so there's some numbers on this on this chart that you see on here that are really pretty bad. Um, and we had some turnover the end of the year that led to that. But you need to be measuring how quickly you're responding to your clients. So we use ConnectWise, and in ConnectWise we can set up service level agreement or service SLAs. And depending on the contract level, we've promised clients that we will respond within a certain level of time, or a certain amount of time. And if we categorize our tickets correctly, the system will measure for us how well we're doing on that. So um, now that we've gotten through the turnover, and we've got some new people in place, we've worked through a backlog of tickets, we're focusing on um, making sure we are resolving our tickets in the time frames we're promising. And we're still not doing near as good a job of that as we need to, but we're working on that. The other kind of trap that we fell into, and I know a lot of other people have fallen into, is as, as you're growing your service offerings with the staff that you have, Everybody who's there, if you're relatively small, knows all your clients. They know what needs to be done. They know what's included in your service plan and what's not. And you take all that for granted and you don't document it. And then if you bring in someone new, either because you're growing and you need an additional person to handle the volume of work you've got, or you have somebody leave and you need to bring someone in new, it's really, really painful because they just have to ask questions and have someone explain everything to them. And that's when your service delivery starts suffering. So now we're going back and we're starting to, to put more documentation in place and of course, you know, my techs don't really want to document that. That's why it's not done in the first place. But they're starting to see that answering the questions takes a lot more time than it would have taken if they had just documented it in the first place. So as you grow, it's really important that you don't let that slide and you document things as you go. Okay. So I want to remind all our listeners that if you have any questions for Linda, we've only got about uh, 10 minutes left or so uh, on today's call. So um, so you mentioned you're using ConnectWise. When did you uh, put in place a PSA system? We did that before we started doing managed services. We did that in 2005. We were something like partner number 50 for ConnectWise. So we've been a ConnectWise partner for a long, long time. And what are you using for RMM? We use primarily Kaseya. Um, we have Continuum now on our servers doing some additional monitoring for us, primarily because that's easier than figuring out how to set it all up in Kaseya, but that's what we're doing today. 
Okay. And can you talk a little bit about how eFolder uh, services fit into your portfolio? Well, we started with eFolder before eFolder, before anyone had a BDR, actually. Um, we had some clients, primarily software clients, that we wanted to provide off-site backup for their application data in, that's in our software. So we partnered with eFolder to deliver that service to them. That's been really, really profitable for us because we won't do it for under $50 a month, and most of them have you know, only a couple of gigabytes of data, so it doesn't cost us very much, and we're charging a pretty good price for it. Now, for that price, we make it pretty all-inclusive. If they need a file restored, we'll restore it for them at no additional charge, and we can afford to do that because we're charging them $50 every month, no matter how little they're backing up. And then um, when eFolder then offered a BDR product, it only made sense that we would just add that in. We're already familiar with the company. Um, we know we're going to get great support if there's any issues, and so we've just added that to it. Um, BDR can sometimes be a great lead-in um, in fact, we have some BDRs for clients that we don't do anything else for. They have their own IT department, but we have a BDR sitting there, and it's you know pretty, you know, put it in, get it all set up, and just you know monitor it, deal with the few issues that do come up, and collect the money. Great. And you you mentioned a little earlier in the conversation uh, the marketing campaign you did around the holidays, where you were able to. I mean, you dropped a. You know, a couple scores of uh, e or direct mail pieces, and you got three BDR uh, client adoptions. What, what was the what was the hook, or what was the call to action, or or how do you warm up or, or target a, a BDR client? Well, it wasn't even direct mail; it was email. Okay. Um, so basically, I just talked to them. You know, John Matazzi, that some of you may know from Joplin, who was struck by the tornado a year ago, is a friend of mine. And I've heard his story several times. And as I listened to that story, you know, I started thinking about what if that was me and what if that was my clients? Would I have recovered as quickly as he did? And so I led with, with that story. You know, hey, Mr. Client, I have a friend. This is what happened to him. That got me to thinking about your particular situation and how quickly you could recover if that happened to you. And I just want to be sure that you understand the consequences of what you're doing now for backup. And then from there, we, you know, we could have a conversation about how long could they really afford to be down and you know, were they comfortable with that or did they want to do something that would allow them to be back up and running more quickly than their current choices. And and how do you how do you price and package your BDR offering? What are what's the what's your approach? Um, well we, we use the tool that you provide and look at how much data they have out there now and how fast we expect it to grow. Now if we're talking to one of our clients, a managed service clients, we have the history of how fast their data has grown because I keep their monthly management reports for forever. So I can go back and see what their disk usage was on a month-to-month -month basis, which allows me to pretty much predict where it's going to go in the future if their situation doesn't change dramatically. And uh, we, we cover the unit continues to belong to us. We do like a $500 setup fee and then mark what's left up by 30% and spread that over the life of the contract. And then the expected monthly charges, we double, I believe, to come up with the price to the client. Okay. Okay. And so I think, you know, just just doing kind of a back of the envelope, you I mean you're going to end up with, you know, pretty attractive, you know, 50 50 percent gross margins on a recurring basis with a solution like that. So right. that's really and, strong cash flow. And of course your tool is averaging the expected usage over the life of the contract, so the profits kind of front loaded which means Absolutely. we're actually paying for that unit much more quickly than over the life of the contract because there's kind of extra margin up front.
Oh, that's right. I mean, that's a really good point to make. That So uh, what Lynn is referring to is eFolder supplies all of our partners with a, a BDR pricing tool, which allows you to, to really forecast over a, you know, 18 to 24-month period, that, you know, how much cloud off-site the client will likely consume. And then that should got, and that'll give you kind of your theoretical maximum wholesale, you know, theoretical maximum cloud usage, and then hence your wholesale cost. And then if you then based your retail price off of that, really the first, the first nine to twelve to twenty-four months, you know, the first nine to twelve months, you're going to be making much higher than fifty percent gross margins if you simply doubled that forecast, right? So that's right. what that's what she means by by front loaded. Um, um, so a couple. So just want to remind everybody, we've got a couple more minutes for questions. Um, uh, Todd wants to know: um, Do any of your clients? I guess this might be in relation to BDR, but do any of your clients come to you and shop on price? And and do you ever find you're having to adjust your prices in response to that? There are certainly clients who shop on price. If that's really how they're going to make the decision, they're not the right client for me. Um, we actually offer a four-year, this is not about BDR, four-year managed services contract where it's not exactly half because we don't replace equipment up front. We replace it evenly over the life of the contract. So most recently I'm recalling a prospect that a competitor came in and I think this has happened a couple times. Their monthly price is about the same as our monthly price. But we are including, if they have 24 machines, we're going to replace a machine every other month. Our competitor has nothing like that. So we're delivering more value for the money than our competitor is. Okay. So you've got to figure out where your value is and what makes you different from your competitors. So Beverly wants to know, how do you move a client from a 12-month from a term to multi-year agreements? Four-year agreements, that's pretty impressive. So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, what we do is we set our price really, really high if you want a one-year agreement. And then we give a significant, like a 20% discount if you sign a three-year agreement. And then with the four-year agreement, the price doesn't change and you get the replacement machine. So we're, ah, okay. we're throwing value in for those longer agreements. Now, we also, though, I mean, if, if you, this client hasn't worked with you and doesn't know you, they may not be willing to sign that four-year agreement. So our contracts say that, you know, for cause, they can get out of the contract at any time. Without cause, they can give us 30-day notice and they can get out. But if they were on a four-year agreement, there are certain penalties involved with that. They would owe us back the 20% discount we gave them, and they would have to then buy the machines that we replaced, the new machines that we gave them, they would then have to buy those on top. Okay. So they're not going right. to just change their mind. <laughs> right. Right. No, and it's an, and it's a give and it's a give get equation, and it sounds very fair. You know that if somebody's making a four-year commitment to you all, then you're, you're including a lot of value for that. But if they decide to pull the plug on that and, and go elsewhere, then you know there's a clawback, and that's a, that's a fairly, I think, all, you know, all rational business people are are familiar with that. So right. and, your and risk see that is a, if they go out of business, then it doesn't really matter what your contract says. So you have that risk. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you know, just uh, just to kind of wrap us up here, I just want to kind of summarize for everybody. You know, Linda's three key points: just get started. If you're not yet really driving a recurring revenue model, just do it. Just get started. Don't be a perfectionist. Um, just get started with offering a new model. Um, set clear goals on where you want to go on an annual and a, and a quarterly basis, and master your service delivery and do some of the things that, that Linda's doing in her practice, like you know running a professional services automation tool like ConnectWise, um, having clear SLAs with your clients that keep everybody on task from a goal perspective, and document, document your processes so when you do have turnover in your workforce, which everybody will experience from time to time, that it's not reinventing the wheel when you bring new people on board. So. Um, with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us for 
today's eFolder Partner Chat. Linda, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome, Ted. Okay, and uh, this concludes today's session, and this is Ted Holsey with eFolder signing off. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care now.